A prayer before we start. Almighty God, Heavenly Father, we know that you love us unconditionally. We know that you call us to be your people. Each one of us a child of God in a relationship with you through Christ. Lord, draw near to us now as we contemplate your word, its relevance for us today, the promises it holds, and the love it displays. Amen. So here we are. The minister is on the golf course, and there's an atheist businessman, and they're doing a round together, and it's a beautiful day. Well, golfers tell me that there's no such thing as a bad day on the course. And they're out there and they meet the first green in regulation. And then the minister two putts. And the businessman three putts. Now, you know when you three putt, it's the second putt that misses. And he, and he missed that one and he went... Damn, blast, missed. And the minister thought, well, that's strange. On to the second hole, regulation, three putt, damn, blast, missed. And right to the end of the round, every hole, he said, damn, blast, missed, when he missed that putt. And at the end of it, the minister looked up to God and said, God, can you not do something about this? The clouds parted. A thunderbolt came down. But it hit the minister. <laughs> and God said, Damn, blast, missed. <laughs> we, have a, we have a view of God's wrath as being something that he's ready and, and just waiting to go boom on us when we do something wrong. And yet, that's not true. That's not true. The Bible tells us something completely different. The Bible tells us that God loves us unconditionally. I don't know about you, but when I watch the news or read it on the tablets and bits and pieces that you've got, or even occasionally in a paper. You know, it's full of things which rend your heart, of starving babies, of war-torn areas, of knife and gun violence. It can all be a bit depressing. And then amongst that, you've got sensational journalism, tabloid telltales, people being found guilty by the press before they've even got to court and been charged. We wonder how people can do that and sometimes it makes your blood boil, doesn't it? And the thing is that you wouldn't like to see me if I was angry. I promise you that. If I'm angry, I turn green, rip open my shirt, not the trousers, and I get a bit of a rage. And uh, that's... Uh, Really what happens, the adrenaline flows and when that courses, anything can happen. I remember in the early 2000s when I was studying at Aberdeen University for my Certificate of Christian Studies on a telephone call one night and we were talking about anger and uh, we were talking about sin and that and the conversation got around to something and then I said on the phone to all the other students, there was about 18 of them I think on the course and the tutor, I could kill in hot blood. And there was stunned silence on the phone. No one said a word. They thought, we've got a homicidal maniac here. <laughs> and the truth is that in the right situation, when adrenaline is flowing, and you have a right hot blood anger, you can do anything. Because I tell you, if I walked into my house and found someone raping Fiona, I would not say, 
sorry, you're not supposed to do that. I would, my blood would boil and then my anger and my actions would be uncontrollable for a period of time. Hot-blooded anger. When we're in that situation, we can do things which hurt people, which cause damage. Our rational moments disappear. I can be full of wrath, and that takes us to our reading today. It's, we're heading in Christ as our serious. Our reading today is Colossians 3 6. Because of these things, the wrath of God is coming. Because of these things, the wrath of God is coming. I'd just like to read a few more uh, verses from that. You used to walk in these ways, Paul writes in Colossians, in the life you once lived. But now you must rid yourself of all such things as these, of anger, of rage, of malice, of slander and filthy language from your lips. Don't lie to each other, he says. Take off your old self and its practices and you have put on the new self which is being renewed in the knowledge and the image of its creator. Take off your old self, put on the new. Now we're talking about God's wrath and the first thing I really want you to know is that God loves you. God loves you unconditionally. Go and turn to a neighbour and say that. Just assure them that God loves you unconditionally. <laughs> and that's the central core of the gospel. That God loves... There is nothing, nothing that you can do to make God love you less. And there is nothing that you can do to make God love you more. He loves you with a perfect love. And if that's the only thing you take away today from the sermon, that's a good thing. Because we know that. John 3.16, the most translated verse of the Bible, for God so loved the world, God so loved the world that he gave his son, that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. But we often forget Six, the verse 17 for God did not send his son into the world to condemn it but to save it through him Jesus Christ gave his life up for you and me and everyone so that we may have life in its fullness now and in eternity the way the Bible puts it is that he gave his life as a sin offering for us. That on the cross, he took our place. He died in our stead and he deflected the wrath of God. So knowing that, knowing the centrality of the gospel is that God is for us and not against us, what are we to make? Of Colossians 3 6 today because of these the wrath of God is coming are we to ignore it because it doesn't fit in with our modern sensibilities of life and its freedoms and its liberties no I don't think so God's word is far too important to pick and mix we can't just take the bits we like and leave the bits we don't so we have to understand what this passage is saying, what these words mean. The dictionary definition of wrath is anger, violence, or stern indignation. It's also divine vengeance or retribution or a fit of anger or act resulting from anger. And when we talk about the wrath of God, we think of the divine vengeance or retribution. You know, when I get angry, and I do get upset from time to time, it's variable. You know, it's not level, it's not fair, and 
sometimes something will wash over me and it doesn't bother me and then the next day it does and I get really edgy and tetchy about it. Um, and when it happens and when it really happens I can erupt like a volcano for our actions vary with our mood and the consequences of the action depending on our mood varies and can have drastic consequences. But God's wrath is not like that. God is not vindictive, he's not capricious, and he's not mercurial. His word assures us that he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. It's not like he wakes up with a sore head and gets angry. Well, God doesn't sleep, does he? If God loves us, and we know that, then his wrath is not directed at us personally. His wrath is not directed at us personally. But the wrath of God does have purpose. Genesis 1, 1 tells us that God created everything. It also has the frame through it that God saw that what he had made was good. You know, gardening's quite hard work, isn't it? Digging and planting and weeding and sowing and cutting the grass and all that sort of thing. You put a lot of effort into your garden. So when something comes along and disturbs it and destroys it, then you're not well pleased, are you? The winds and gales of during the week the, uh, have laid low greenhouses and sheds and other bits and pieces in the garden. And don't talk to my wife about cat poo and dog poo either because she just hates that. So when sin entered creation, God was not best pleased. He created a good world and Satan entered into the scene. God created the garden so that he could walk with us, that he could talk with us, that he could have a personal relationship with us, and Satan destroyed that. It's often said about the creation story that the problem wasn't the apple, it was the pear on the ground. But actually, I think it was the snake in the grass. Paul reminds us that creation itself was frustrated. God created everything good and well and right and he is rightfully angry that the devil spoiled it. God's wrath is not his disposition towards us because he loves us so much. God's wrath is his disposition towards us sin itself towards the evil the wrong that we do God loves the sinner but not the sin he loves the sinner but not the sin just as with the uh, children's address there we had the magnets and the, if they got the poles the wrong way around you just cannot get they cannot touch they cannot stay together. And that is what sin does in our relationship to God. It is a barrier. God and sin cannot coexist in the same space. But if we are not sinful, then nothing will separate us from God. And that's what Jesus did. We are hidden in Christ. He came so that we could divest ourselves of our old selves and all the wrong and all the wrath and all the anger and all the malice and put on new clothes, the clothes of Christ. In the very early days of the church when people were being baptised into Christ and professing him as Lord and Saviour and ruler of their lives, they were often given a completely new set of clothes, 
after the baptism to symbolize the changing in their lives. We are hidden in Christ when we put on Christ's clothing. When we say that we will accept and adopt Christ's teachings and put them into practice. And when we own him as Lord and Saviour. That's what being hidden in Christ means and that's what protects us from the wrath of God. Satan, in his desire to separate us from God, makes sin look something nice and good. It never starts off as being bad. You know, uh, someone who likes a drink just as a, to relax in the evening if you take that too far, they can become an alcoholic. It's the same with drugs. It's the same with any, anything. It becomes too big in our lives. A neighbour across the road from us has four cars. Four cars and he's driving on the pavement outside. And he religiously washes them every Sunday. Whether they're needing washed or not, he's out there... Polish, washing, polishing, doing up the chrome and things like that. It's almost their idols to him. That is what he does. And he likes that the devil tempts us away from God with many, many different schemes and ways. And God is rightfully angry about that. God's wrath is his view and disposition towards sin not the sinner we somehow feel that God's wrath is something that's applied every single day like when when someone, something happens to someone who's bad, you say that's God's vengeance and justice on them but actually God's wrath doesn't happen day by day by day the consequences of our sin and our wrong are enough God doesn't need to intervene because when you hurt someone your relationship with them is broken. When you steal you're constantly looking over your shoulder to be found out. When you have an adulterous relationship you're fearful of people finding out and the consequences that will do to your marriage. Sin has its own consequences. God does not need to come along every minute of every day watching us and causing us to, to be wrathful to us and causing extra things to happen to us because of our sin. He doesn't do that. God's wrath will manifest itself at the end of the age when we are all called to account for our actions. It will happen when Jesus Christ returns to earth to take up the throne which is rightfully his as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And that is when God's wrath will appear. Sin, which is totally which God is totally against is anything, anything that replaces God at the centre of our lives and our relationship with the Father. Anything that we idolise that separates us from God. The New Testament scholar F.F. F. Bruce put it like this. He says, we experience the inevitability, inevitable consequences of our free choice. Living in a condition of sin in rebellion to God cannot bring up anything but sadness in our lives. Holiness is written in our conscience and constitution in the very fibre of our being. When we sin, when we argue with people, when we retaliate, when we idolise things, it doesn't really make us happy. People think it does, but it will not bring happiness. Because we worry about the consequences. But remember, God is for us. That's why he hates sin. He doesn't need to watch us big brother style. He loves us. He adores us. And he grieves when we turn away from him. 
And you know what parent doesn't grieve when their children ignore them, go their own separate ways, think they know better about life, that young old head on young shoulders. If your children are going out hurting themselves and having to live with the consequences of that, don't you grieve for them? Don't you want it, them to be everything to be right in their lives? And God wants that for us as well as our Father in heaven. We are hidden in Christ when we accept him as Lord and Saviour. And in that being hidden in Christ, the wrath of God is diverted. At the end of the age, that is when God's wrath will appear. When God will say, I cannot, you cannot come here, I cannot have a relationship with you because of your sin. Or he will say, Come into my presence, good and faithful servant. The outworking of the wrath of God is simply this. It's the loneliness of a life and an eternity out with the presence of God. Out with that father-child relationship which he desires of us. We are rightful to be fearful of God's wrath because the consequences are sorrow, are a life of sorrow, a life of hurt, and eventually, I think, an eternity out with God's presence. God's wrath towards sin. God's wrath towards sin led him to send Jesus Christ into the world to stand in our place. To stand in our place. To bear the consequences of the wrong in our lives so that we may be presented sinless at the day of judgment. Perfect before our loving God. God's wrath is not capricious, malicious, vengeful. For God loves us too much. Without God's wrath, there would not be mercy love and grace. They are two sides of the same coin. God loves us too much to leave us alone to our own devices. That's why he sent Jesus. That's why we can be hidden in Christ. And that's why we will be able to stand before the throne and be allowed into the presence of God. Amen. Our offering for God's work will be uplifted.